This video tutorial is designed to help teachers who are not familiar with Google Forms build assignments, quizzes, tests in Google Forms. I am going to post in Classroom and on YouTube where I'm going to post this um, timestamps about specific things in the description so that if you don't want to watch the whole video, you can go to the particular timestamp that discusses the element you want to discuss. So feel free to jump wherever the timestamp indicates of what you're interested in. So the first thing you want to do is open up the Chrome browser. Do not use uh, Safari, Firefox, any of those others. You really need to use Chrome or else things do not work correctly. So when you click on the grid up here in the upper right hand corner, then you will look for the Forms tab. It may be located in a different place on that menu, but it is there. It's going to bring you to the Forms uh, menu and it will show the uh, assignments you have created. Down here on the right is your plus bar to create a new form, which is what we're going to do. It'll now take a moment to load up a new blank form. And the first thing that I do once it's loaded up is I go ahead and I name the form. We'll call this, well, for some reason it's putting me down there. There we go. We'll call this practice three. This is my third version of this. Now, once I click on that, that's now the name of it. Up here is the file title. If you go ahead and click that, it will automatically assume you want it to be the same as the title you typed here. But you have to click it. It's not going to do it automatically. I also recommend that you go through, you, you move it. It is just sticking it in your drive, but you won't know where that's at. And so clicking on the little folder here gives you a drop down of your drive and you can decide where you want it to go. So in this case, I'm going to put it in my practice folder. I'm going to move it there. You can also go into the search box in your drive and always find it if you know what the name of it is, but I don't always remember the name of my various assignments. So let's look at some of the features that we have here. We're not going to talk about add-ons today. Uh, we have very limited add-ons we can use with this particular, with forms, with this particular app. You can choose your colors, theme options, choose an image, which we'll put a little image above there, choose a, a color you like, um, how dark you want it. You can choose a font style. There's only a few font styles. I keep it pretty basic um, myself because that's easier uh, to read. Now, but moving on over, we have this little eyeball here, the preview. This function is designed for you to look at it in the way students will see it. So when you click on that, it's going to open in a, a new tab, and you can see exactly the way students will see that, that assignment appear on their screen. The next thing is the gear bar, the settings. And that's where a, you really want to focus. You want to make sure, my personal thoughts, that you're always collecting email addresses. I've got that set as a default feature. Uh, that is not a default feature normally. There's a setting for that. I'll show you here in a minute so you can all make sure you're always collecting email addresses. Response receipts. I do not care for response receipts. That's just an email that it generates to them saying, here's, you did this assignment and here's the answers you gave. Well, that allows them then to share answers uh, if somebody else hasn't done the assessment yet. I do always have restrict to Orangefield users. That forces them to sign into their student account. Limit to one response. I usually have that clicked. I normally, on assignments, I don't want kids doing more than one 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 test or doing redoing a test. Uh, plus students get used to that limitation and if they, they do sometimes go back to look at the form or the assignment to see if it took and if they open it back up and it shows it doesn't tell them they've already done it, 
then they do it again. And you end up, they'll do it three or four times before they tell you. And then you've got all these submissions that you didn't want. You can uh, click edit after submit. That means they submit it. And then right after that, they realize they wanted to change something or they forgot something. They can open it right back up. That's only in that session. Once they close that tab, that doesn't work. So I don't use that at all. Let's move on to presentation. A few features here. You can show progress bar. I never do, uh, but you could on a longer assignment so the student knows where they're at, how much more they have in the assignment. You might want to shuffle the question order. If you click on shuffle the question order, then that allows questions to be moved around. And as each student opens, they get the same questions, but they get them in different orders from each other. That way, if they're looking at their screen from desk to desk, they, um, they're not get looking at the same answer. Um, that's a link for another response. That's only if you want students to be able to submit an, a, a, an assignment or an assessment more than once. You could have a link there where they could do that. Once they, once they submit their, their form, their assignment, this is the uh, generic uh, confirmation that shows up on the screen. And normally I'll do, I'll change it to thanks, have a happy Bobcat, oh, capitalize Bobcat, Bobcat day. Just because it makes them groan. And uh, yeah, there we are. Oops. Uh, so presentation, you can adapt the message as you want the confirmation message. This next tab, quiz. You can make this a quiz. It allows for it to be auto graded. If you don't make it a quiz, it doesn't auto grade. Uh, now you can only auto grade multiple choice and uh, there's only certain uh, types of questions you can auto grade. In theory, you can auto grade short answer, but you, they have to type it exactly as you did, and that doesn't work well. So I usually turn that on for a couple of reasons. It just, everything functions better for me that way. If you have them in the classroom and you don't want them, you're, they're on the Chromebooks and you don't want them opening additional tabs, you can turn on locked mode. That prevents them from being able to open additional tabs while they're taking a test, but it does mean they have to be on a school district Chrome book. They can't be on a school district computer. They can't be on their phone uh, doing the, the test on their phone. They can't do, they have to be on a school district Chromebook. They can't use a personal Chromebook. So that one you got to think about, especially with distance education, that may not work as well um, all the time. It's set automatically to release their grade as soon as they submit. That's fine if it's all multiple choice, but even then I don't care for that. Now, if you scroll a little bit, you'll see there's more there. The way this is set, they will automatically at the end get their grade, the question they missed, the correct answer, and the point value. Well, that allows them to share that with other people who haven't taken the assessment yet. I don't like that. So I do later after manual review. That turns email collection on, which I already have on, so that when you release the score, uh, it emails them to their school email. I also don't like for them to be able to see missed questions and correct answers. I just, I don't care for that. Point values, a lot of times I don't, but I use another program to grade outside of forms that I'll, I'll talk about in a future video. So let's move on. There are some other features. Um, I use make a copy quite a bit. That will make an, a whole new copy of the quiz. That's useful if you're doing modifications or accommodations where you're having to uh, provide a shortened quiz or fewer answer choices, things like that. Once you've created your main quiz, then you can just make a copy of it and rename it, you know, modified practice three or, or whatever, and, and be able to then do your modifications for those students that require that. 
Now, this is a required question, and I know that because it has the red asterisk. So how do we add sections, titles, um, and questions? Well, the first thing I always do is um, I always start my first question, or before my first question here, I always add a title, which is what this TT is here, title and description. And this section, this first little, little section that I do is student information. So my first question is always last name. Now, it's automatically got the point value at one. I don't want that being counted for or against them. So what I did there, and I did it very quickly without thinking about it, is I clicked on the answer key, which allows me to select or type the correct answer, and then select the point value. Since it's just the student's name, I'm, I'm not going to have a point value. Now, I asked their last name. I want to know their first name. So that's my next question. Some, some teachers put it all in one. I don't because I like to have separate, uh, separate questions. And then the next thing I ask them is always their class period. It's much easier for me to be able to sort in my Google Sheet when I grade if I have a class period, um, if I've had them do their class period. So once I do period, it shows multiple choice. That is a default. It will try to interpret, for example, up here, and I may not have said that, when I typed first name, it understood I wanted a short answer. Sometimes it's not perfect. So class period, <clears throat> and then I put in the first answer, first period, second, third, and all I'm doing is I am hitting the down arrow as I enter each number that I want. In this case, I, just my own stylistic, I, it can be multiple choice, but I like drop down on that particular question, but it can be multiple choice. Um, once I've got those things, particularly if I am having it scramble the questions, I don't want them going halfway through the test and then it asking them their last name. That can be disorienting. So to prevent that, if I'm having it scramble questions, is I use this add a section. That makes this information here one section. It will move these questions around within that section, but it's not going to move them across sections. So this one's always, I'll say the test or the assessment or whatever for my section two. Now you get into actually building your real questions. You've already seen um, how the basic question looks. Over here on the right, you have the drop down where you can choose the question type. So it does try to figure out what you want, but it's not always right. So short answer you've already seen. Paragraph is very similar to short answer. The main difference is that short answer on the form is only going to show the students a few words of what they're typing. Paragraph will allow them to see a larger box of what they've typed. There is no upper limit on short answer or paragraph. It can be as long as they type, but it just gives them a little more space on paragraph to be able to see uh, what all they've typed and scroll back through it and look through it easier. Multiple choice is the one that a lot of teachers will use the most. And so you might have a question, um, what was Riding Hood's, what, let me go back here, what color was Riding Hood's jacket? So I've got my question. Then I start putting in my answers. And my answer can be, let's say, 
red, down bar, blue, down bar, green, down bar, black. And you can put as many answer choices as you want or as few as you want. All right. So if you're having, if you want it to self grade, you'll want to go ahead and set your answer. So down here in the lower left, you see answer key. You click on that. You can select how many points you want it to be. And then you select the correct answer. So click done. And then it brings you back to the outer, um, question where you can revise the question as you want. You'll see also that there's a check mark there. You'll also notice that there is a place to add an image and you can do that. You can actually um, go in and add images if you wish. Uh, particularly for lower level where maybe they're still learning to read or, or something like that or you just want to dress it up and make it uh, nice. You can upload from your device. You can go from your Google Drive, images from your Google Drive. Um, you can do an image um, search, the color red. Okay, so I might choose to insert red. And then I might choose, that was blue. And it gives me the options and you could choose that for each color if you wanted to do that. And then the students see the picture and the name. So that's a neat feature as well. All right, let's move on to the next type of question. Going down, let's add a question again. And Let's look at the next option you have, check boxes. Check boxes is similar to multiple choice, only with um, check boxes, um, they can choose more than one answer. With multiple choice, they can only choose one answer. With the check boxes, they can choose multiple answers. And again, once you've done that, you go in, set your answer key, say two and four, set your point value, and there you go. All right, moving on to the next type of question is the drop down. We did the drop down already. File upload. I know some teachers have. Um, had students submit pictures of their work. And this allows you to actually have students submit documents, pictures, and other files um, in a Google form. It's not perfect, but you can actually do that within a Google form. So we're going to look at that here for a moment very quickly. So if you have chosen this um, feature where they can upload a file, it will give you a warning that they can upload files or that they will be able to do that. Uh, there are several things you can do here, and this might work well for math or chemistry. It's not perfect, but it might help with some of those, um, those things where you want them to have something written and get an image of it. So, you can select the file type, allow only specific file types. So maybe you want an Im them to take an image of their work, which I'll show you a sample of, of my having done that earlier, or a document, or a PDF, or a video. You can choose how many files they can upload for this question. Maybe it's multi-page and you want, they need to upload multiple pages. Once again, you want to choose how many points it's worth. Maybe because you want to be able to do some partial credit, maybe you want it worth five points rather than just one point or, or whatever. Um, but you'll be able to see that. 
when you uh, you'll be able to actually see the image when you go through the Google form and look at it. So you can also insert though images of your own in your questions as well as your answers. So for example, if I were teaching a math course, I might have a written out image. So let's go to my practice here and I'll do question one. And so then there is my math question. So um, I might say show all your work on paper and upload an image of that work. So that gives them what they need to do that. How does that look on the other side? Well, let's take a look. And then you can scroll down and there is your uh, image of the, of the equation. My cursor, I caught the cursor there. I should have moved the cursor out of the way before I took the image. They can then add the file that they want to add. So they'll just click. It will give them the choice to upload um, or they can pull from their drive and the kid can upload the file and then when you see it you can click on it and it will pull it up so you can actually see the work demonstrated. But that's a way that you could um, display your math problems or whatever work you want. It doesn't have to be math. Other subjects might have use of this as well and then have students add the file that they want. And you'll see also you can do the full document. You don't have to do just um, one problem at a time. If I allow documents to be added, let's say I took an image of all the math problems. It will display all of them then on the image that I want them to do and then they can actually go in and attach a document if they were doing it on Google Docs. Uh, again, I'm using math as an example, but that doesn't have to be math. All right, moving to the next question type. We have linear scale. And linear scale is just, it gives you like a one to five or a one to 10 or whatever you choose. And then um, let's say a screen. And I may say one is good and five is bad. And then the students can choose based on the linear scale. And again, you can look at that and see that that gives them a linear scale. And you, they can have a point value with that, or you can choose to have no point value if you're just asking a random question that you don't want it to be necessarily graded against them. The next question I want to talk about is the multiple choice grid. Now, if you select that, then you end up with rows and columns. There is a concern with this, and rather than build this, because it'd take a minute, I'm actually going to show you another feature that you can do for inserting questions. Let's say you are doing a unit and you're building the final test and you have multiple quizzes that you want to pull questions from and maybe just revise the question, but you want to go ahead and pull those questions over or you just want to pull the question over totally. You can do that. 
without having to copy and paste questions or, or any of those sorts of things. You can actually import the question from another Google form. So that's what this tab here is. So when you click on import form, it's going to pull up the recent forms that you have used. I'm going to go to this form that I prepared earlier and it's going to pull up and I can actually pick all the questions, any of the questions I want. So for example, let's select um, these last few here so I don't have to write these questions and we can just take a look at them and, and how they lay out and some things to watch out for with them. Once I've selected the check questions I want from that quiz or assignment, then I can just import them over. And what it will do is it will import them wherever I was at on the form. So you want to make sure you're, in this case, you were after the last question. And it will bring them over. Now, I have two versions of this question here, and the reason I have that is because I want to show you the layout because there's a bit of a problem that can come up with this. But if you do multiple choice grid, that means they can only choose one per one answer per uh, row element. And it automatically, because there are four questions, it automatically thinks you want four points. And down here with the larger one, it thinks that you want, I think it's 12 on this one. Yeah, 12 points. So you need to go back and change that if you don't like that point value. One of the issues, though, with this, <clears throat> if we look on the student view, this isn't too bad. The student can go and choose the answer that they want and um, then move on from that question. The issue though is, and I've seen this happen a few times with um, teachers, is if you have too many choices because you're not seeing all the choices here. You're not seeing those choices. In order to see all the choices, you have to use the right tab or the right, I'm not right tab, right arrow to be able to scroll back and right and left arrow to scroll back and forth between all the choices. Students will not notice that. You can also, this is the same way, but this one is, again, this is check boxes rather than multiple choice. Check boxes allow them to um, select uh, multiple answers. Now, as you get students answering questions, their responses will be recorded in the response box. When you want to look at and grade um, in forms the student responses, you click on this here. You see there are two responses, and it brings you to... Stop it. It brings you to... Um, the summary of all the student submissions. This can be interesting because it allows you to see, you know, how many correct they got on each question. In some cases, in many cases, it will give you a, a graph, a pie chart or a graph, so you can see who answered what, or not who answered what, but how many answered what. And you also can, if you are grading, these images, these, the, you know, grading an image or a video or something like that, you can click on it from there, open it up, and be able to look at it. Now, if you wanted to provide direct feedback on this image, that's a little more difficult. You can go through and add a comment. Um, You can go in and add a comment and it will add it there. 
The difficulty is the student won't see it. You'll see it every time you look because you have that particular link. In order, the only way I can figure out, because I know some teachers wanted to do this, for you to be able to do that is to go up here to the three dots after you do it and share it back. But that means you're doing it right then or you're going back through and doing it at the end where you're sharing it and you're having to go in and type the student's name uh, in. Of course, you know, you'll get those and then you can send it back and when they get it back then they'll be able to open that image and actually see the image and your comments that is the only way i can see that that working it's not perfect um, but it's the best solution i could find for those of you that wanted to make comments on the image directly now if you're going to grade you go over to the individual tab here you can i'm sorry you can look at it by question as well let's do that and you can select the question and look at each of the answers. Okay. And you can see that you can do some grading here. So, you know, one student answer red. And so that's correct. And you would mark it as correct. One student answered uh, blue. That's incorrect. You could mark it as incorrect. Now, it's doing it automatically because we chose those, so it's already done it. But let's say you realize that you made your key wrong, incorrectly. Then you could go back. Maybe you asked the question in a way that was not making sense, and you can change that answer. You can override it. And then you can also move on to the next question that way. To me, this is a little awkward. Um, if I'm going to grade in forms, I'm going to do it by individual, where I see their name, class period, and I see the answer choices that they made. And again, it's automatically grading for correct and incorrect answers. But like this, I can then click on the image, grade it. And if they messed up a little bit, I want partial credit or whatever, I may put four out of five. And it says edits are pending. And you say, yeah, I'll go with that grade. And you'll go through and grade that way. Those are the ways you grade in Google Forms. When you're ready to return the grade, um, let's say you're ready to return the grade to all the students. Let me see here. Um, then you can click release the score, and you can choose either the individual or choose all respondents, and you can send them emails and release, and it will send them their grade. And if you allowed them to see the question or the answers they got wrong specifically, it will send that as well. It will also automatically update in Google Classroom. I do not grade this way very often. I use a different program, which I'll do a video on called Fluberoo. And that just, for me, that works a little better. It also allows me to grade open-ended a little easier than Google Forms. But that's the basics of Google Forms. I hope this helped. I threw a lot of information at you. Feel free to come back and consult the video or, or go to various parts. Remember, I am putting uh, timestamps on each section labeling it so that you can go to the particular thing you're trying to do. If I didn't cover a question, please feel free to email me at rchevalier at orangefieldisd.net um, and I'll be happy to help you.